economics of, mu- of music and putting music out is almost impossible for the consumer to get their heads around, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, so much aspects of the music industry are like not known by like everyday people uh, that I didn't know about till I'm actually an, a musician or artist or whatever, you know? So it's, I think it's meant that way, you know? It's to, it's meant, the secrets are meant that way to keep the everyday person out. Not a uh, reliance, I guess, on on the bigger the bigger guys, you know. Killer Killer podcast. Killer Killer official dot com. You need the Television app. Twenty four seven mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Well, music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast for your sins. What a beautiful morning it is. And uh, thank you for joining us. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. If you haven't already, get involved. The Television app is in full effect for all your street culture, sport and art activities that you may be entertaining yourself with on a day to day, particularly on weather that's been going on like this recently. Beautiful, sunny weather. Um, and hopefully by the time this goes out, it will still retain the sun, man. Big shout out to everybody that checks out the show on a regular. We've got special guests inside the place. Um, multi-talented, collaborator, singer. I mean, the funk is alive and well <laughs> in the embodiment of Cola Boy over in France at the moment. How are you, brother? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Well, we kind of had a debrief before we jumped in on this. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I know. You're, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're both uh, we're both going through a heat wave right now, right? So yeah, we're slowly we're slowly melting. You, you know, yeah, my uh, <laughs> pretty, I'm feeling pretty sweaty. Luckily, luckily, the, we don't. Our technology is not at that level yet where you can tell. So <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. It's only a matter of time before these Zoom conversations enable you to smell, to feel heat, to, yeah. to feel that every every sense sensory thing possible uh through the net you know um talking of which i got i got turned on to your music about two weeks ago and subsequently i've gone into these wormholes of for those of you that don't know about cola boy it's like it's 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 a combination of different um influences more relatively of now i would and correct me if i'm wrong it's it's almost like nerd kind of Funk, jazz, just a clusterfuck of all sorts of influences, man. And yeah, it's just a pleasure to fucking talk to you, man. I don't know where you get it from. <laughs> I don't know what they put in your cereal, but it's fire. Thank you, man. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned the NR- NERD thing because, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, I really liked uh, Nerd or NERD and Pharrell's production i mean i didn't know like i was a kid i just liked what was on the on the tv and on the radio and stuff so early 2000s that was my my shit um but uh as far as like uh pulling influence from them on a conscious level i never really thought of it and it's funny you mentioned the nrd thing because last couple days i've been you know playing some new demos to my to my team and they've been like yo this sounds like nerd and it's mm-hmm. that thing has been coming up a lot more, which is it's interesting. I used to have a, a a turntable set when I was like eleven or twelve. Uh, my parents got me a couple turntables, and I had a big old NERD sticker on it too. I remember it's such a fond memory. That's that that's that subconscious shit. Yeah, that's that happening. Um, well, I think they start. I think they're making new work music in the works, aren't they? At the moment, I don't know. Uh, that that'd be dope. I think. Uh, Get your tour support like to fan that. ready, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Where to all begin with you, Carlo Boy? Like, uh, let's stick with the music for a second. Like, yeah. because, you know, as a collaborator, I mean, Avalanches, MGMT, you know, these fall in, bang into the pocket of, of your stylistic approach. Like, what's, what is your take on your own music? What is, and what, what, what kind of movements do you make when collaborating with people? I, the, the style, like the more the as my musical career or whatever has uh, moved forward, it's harder to pinpoint what it is 
what style it is that I'm doing because I really, like you said, I've, I kind of incorporate a lot of different genres, different sounds and styles and kind of put them together to create my own thing in a way. Uh, you know, with MGMT and the Avalanches, those uh, collaborations, they, you know, they came pretty naturally, you know. I was lucky enough to th for them to reach out to me and ask to collaborate, you know. Oh, is that how it went down? Yeah. So how did they discover you in the first place? Well, with, with MGMT, MGMT basically, like Andrew, the, the Andrew Van Wingarden, we had some mutual friends and things like that. And I, he just, before I even ever had any music like released, I just had a SoundCloud and he just stumbled on my SoundCloud and like heard my, my demos, liked them. And then I got an email from MGMT's management <laughs> and uh, I was sitting in Paris, like it was on my birthday in 2018 with my girlfriend and like my label and it was snowing and I just get an email like on my phone. It's like, oh, this is MGMT's uh, management and they want to bring you on tour. And I was like, what the hell? It's like, oh, basic email, is it? <laughs> yeah. And so it was on my birthday too. And it was just crazy. So then, you know, I went on tour with them and we became, we became homies. I think I'm a, a kind of a people person. I, 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 you know, I really like socializing and things like that. So yeah, we clicked and we, and then it just kind of naturally, you know, we started, we worked on some music together. That's just bonkers. Yeah. It's bonkers because, and I can see where the interest lies with MGMT and your style and your voice, like your, you know, your, the, 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 the sound of your voice as well. You know, it just is so unique. It, it, it's psychedelia. I mean, it's like got that kind of thing going on where you're just like, yeah, that's. <laughs> so, uh, you know what's the name of? Um, uh, with all due respect, of course, when I say the word Prince, I, I'm, I'm hoping that would dispel any uh, any offense. What I'm about to say, but Prince, you know, when sometimes he would go, what's the name of that character that he would he would um, be, where he would have his voice pitched up a little, and he'd go all oh, funky. We might have funky. What was the name of that? He had I a don't character. Know, I'm not sure, dude. It, it's like. It's a, your style has that kind of quirky uniqueness that I think most artists really wish they had. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I'm really glad because I'm not trying to like, I'm not really just my, the way my voice is, you know, like, and I guess in some ways, I mean, it's, I guess it's because of my disability that like I have kind of a weird, a weird or a different sounding voice, but you know, the more I, 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 you know, work on my singing and I get better at singing generally, you know, the better I am at controlling it and like making it like unique, like it's already unique, but making, being precise and like, you know, like when I'm trying to do a certain thing and, uh, you know, I guess so it's interesting. One of my weaknesses turned into a, a strength for me. So that's pretty cool. That's sick, dude. Like. I love the fact that the more, yeah, oh man, that's cold. That makes that makes your sound and everything so unique. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a hip hop ethos right there. USP style, always come identifiable. No one can replicate that, bro. You know that. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. irrepli It's irreplicable, and I think that's what the charm and the excitement is about you as an artist. I feel. Yeah, I'm really grateful because, you know, I've all my, you know, like people like music that I love and the favorites that, that people like legends in music or, you know, people's favorites are so like, uh, like you could just tell like when something comes on, you know, automatically it's them. And that's one of my favorite things about music, you know, good music is that or a good artist is that you can automatically tell that they have their own this style mm -hmm. about them. It's like a signature. And I love that. And I, uh, yeah, I guess I have that too. So it's pretty cool. I'm happy. Yeah, man. Do you play instruments as well? I'm just going to get in. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, 
I play, I started out, you know, I play guitar, bass, keyboard, uh, piano. Uh, sorry about that. The streets of Paris are live right now, you know. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I play, uh, I play, I can like, I'm decent at uh, like a bunch of instruments, basically. Enough to where I can like, I record my demos and I, I do production on, uh, uh, or I do co-production on a lot of my songs. And um, yeah, I love I love writing songs, right? So like, however I can get to writing a dope song, I'll I'll get there. You know, I you know if I don't know how to try play something, I'll figure it out. Yeah, that's fire. That's fire. And in terms of Paris, what what why are you? How come you're in Paris? It sounds to me like you flick from Europe to to the states quite a bit. Yeah, my uh, record label that I'm on. Record makers, they're a French label based in Paris. And uh, so I come here a lot. Before COVID, I was coming here four times a year, something like that, five right. times a year almost sometimes. And then uh, COVID hit, so I haven't been back in a year and a half. So this is my first time back. So I come here, I do press stuff. I get some recording sessions in. I go to fun parties, you know, of course. And like... Uh, hang out with good friends and yeah, it's kind of like my second home in a way, you know? Why do I get the feeling that I'm in one hand, I'm late to the party, but on the other hand, I'm just at the start of something with you, bro. Why do I feel like this is, this? Is, <laughs> there's this, we're in this sweet spot where it's like, actually you could be really ready to blow anytime soon. Do you know what I'm saying? That would be nice. I, you know? I, yeah. Could be, you know, you never know what these types of things, I guess. So I'm just uh, putting in work, you know, and yeah. uh, trying to make as dope, dope songs as I can. Oh, you really are, bro. You really are. Like getting into it. Where did it all begin, man? When did, when did, how, where, what was the influence? Where, you know, how old were you? I want to know everything from the, from the beginning. Color boy, what, what, tell me, tell me from the start what happened. Well, I think the first memory I have, the first memory I have of ever performing was uh, I was at the mall when I was a little kid, like four, and my parents made me sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on stage when I it would like, you know, in front of a crowd at a mall, like on a random day. Uh, right. And I looked like I was like picking my nose on the stage. just like, just, but for some reason, I, I was down to go up there and do that. And then probably when I was like seven or eight, I used to, my grandmother used to take care of me uh, while my parents worked. So she had a piano in her house. She used to be a lounge singer in the old days. Mm. So she had a piano in her house. And um, so I used to sit on the piano and like, when you're a little kid, you kind of just slam on it. You know, you don't really know what you're doing. I still do that now, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too sometimes. Sometimes you can get a good, good sound that way. But uh <laughs> Yeah, she would tell me, like, yo, like, if you're going to play on that, you're going to play it right. Like, it's not a toy. Yeah. And uh, that stuck with me. And I think that was the beginning. And then I, I tried the drums when I was 10. But I didn't have the discipline yet because I was still a kid. And I just didn't have that discipline to yeah. really focus. And it, did, it wasn't until junior high school when I was, like, 12, I, I picked up the guitar seriously yeah and i learned the guitar and high school i started playing in punk bands and that was like yeah my first live performances and like writing songs and things like that so you were into punk talk to me about the influences of punk like like who were you into back back in the day like who what kind of punk bands were you were you feeling yeah well like uh you know it started out with like the ramones sex pistols the clash you know the the old, the old stuff, the older stuff. And then in high school, I got really into like hardcore punk and like anarcho punk, like Crass, yeah. Rudimentary P9 and stuff like that. Brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, stuff that was really, you know, kind of rebellious and countercultural. Yeah. I, and there's a big punk scene in my town, in my city, that's been around since the 80s. And it's really like a historic part of my town. And so uh, the town uh, being the town Oxnard. being say again uh, Oxnard it's like a 
Yeah, we're Mad Lib and Anderson Packer from from the city I'm from too. Fucking great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, it's in the water. Yeah, and so I think that yeah, I just found a you know I found my scene, and uh, I found people that I could relate to, people that were kind of you know struggling with their own things, and we we had some camaraderie, I guess you know, and uh, so I really just got attracted to the punk scene, you know pretty immediately and it really shaped me it shaped a lot of my politics too like it was like starting the, the foundations of me being you know being like like being rebellious and you know questioning you know questioning society mm, mm. that's one of the greatest things about that's what that's one of the greatest things that punk has to offer challenging the status quo and mm. asking some more serious questions if not verbally than in their actions, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great point that you made about even if not verbally, yeah. And I think it was a good starting point, even if it was just kind of like a nudge towards something, you know? I think what it is is that it really gave me a, it gave me some more confidence too to like go out there and play, you know, play music and and also kind of just, yeah, I don't know, figure figure myself out where I was, you know, why I was kind of like starting to figure out like, oh, I'm angry. These kids are angry too, you know, like, uh, and we're pissed, you know, so mm. let's, let's talk about it. Mm, so piss sure. isn't angry because we don't use the same pissed as you guys do. We're not like drunk. We were drunk though, definitely. It's <laughs> very much like punk and droplix. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Your, your music now, um, I mean, you know, you're dealing with three or four chords with 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 punk, right? Like your your musicality within your songs, you know, the chord progressions and time tempo changes and just general um just general intellect in in and refined quality to to the production. That was the first thing that struck me actually. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, yo, like this is alive and well. We ain't dealing with no you know, bogus here. This is like some proper structured formulate songs. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I really, that goes back to, you know, really uh, letting go and not being one of those egotistical artists who wants to be the guy who does everything himself, you know, mm. and really like opening it up to others to like enhance my songs and like, make them reach their to like as good as they can be, you know, as like getting like, how do I make the best, how can we make the best version of this song? And like, the reality is like, yeah, like I play a few instruments, but I don't know how to rip on the trumpet. I don't know how to rip on the violin. So I'm going to get somebody who, who knows how to do that, you know, or like who knows their way around, you know, a piano, like in a way, a different way than I do. And so I think that, aspect being that like not being so individualistic in that sense has really allowed for my music to reach a level that I'm really proud of I guess you know for sure and like when you have different people and this is only in conclusion to the quality of the songs that you you you've put out when you have more eyes and ears in the in the project the the better it becomes you know People kind of forget about that, don't they? they? It's like everything's sample packs. Everything's in the box. Everything is, like you say, they get super egotistically like protective about shit. But actually, you don't get the best. Exactly. Like nothing, nothing great in this world uh, was done by uh, by one person. Like in the reality, like you know, we talk about history, and they say history. There's these great men in history. Uh, you know, but they, they talk about like this guy who who led a who led this battle, but they don't talk about the soldiers who were the ones fighting. You know, uh, or they talk about this historical point, but they never talk about all the the masses themselves who are the ones who are the makers of history. And I think like people in general, like uh, utilizing people and working together, that's 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 how you really like make st- make transform things and. Uh, create things that are you know really long lasting and special. I love that. I love that comparable. Um, 
in this in this day and age where just sticking to that thing of like you know the the unsung heroes should we say mm-hmm. of the, the song um used to be the case that you know there'd be credit notes at the back of a record or there used to be the featured section they used to you know everything was kind of the personnel was assembled on the back of the album um only recently up until you know online became the thing in the big jukebox in the sky no matter which one you call it but a lot of them nowadays don't have those they don't facilitate the um unsung heroes Mm -hmm. do you think that makes it harder for um artists like yourself to um encourage newer um newer um, musicians and um and students the opportunity to jump on like a project of your of, of yours or, or anyone else's do you mean do you think it's harder i think i i think that the dip, i think things are easier it's easier these days for people to get involved with stuff because of the internet like because of social media and all that but i do think this point you made about about music credits not being featured really, or like little things not being, I think that has a lot to do with like, yeah, it's like p- things are packaged as like, it's like a hyper like capitalist, uh, well not hyper, but it's just, we're at this stage where it's all about the art. Like we're gonna package this artist as like this all being like, like sentient piece of freaking content or whatever, you know, like who cares about, who did this on that or who did that. So I don't know if that has to do with, I don't know if, if that's connected to encouraging people to, to take stuff on, because I think, I think the musician, the studio musician industry has always been like, those people are put behind the scenes in a way too, you know? I don't know. I think your question is a really good one. And I think it's really like, I want to think about that because that's a deep question. Yeah, it's a deep one. It's a deep one, isn't it? We like it deep. Then I get all political in my head about it. Like I'm like analyzing it on like a like the economics of it, and I'm like the economics of music of music and putting music out is almost impossible for the average consumer to get their heads around, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, so much aspects of the music industry are like not known by like everyday people uh that i didn't know about till i'm actually a musician or artist or whatever you know so it's it's pretty interesting and i think it's meant that way you know it's to it's meant the secrets are meant that way to keep the everyday person not a uh, reliance i guess on on the bigger the bigger guys you know um they don't keep those those things a secret for no reason yeah it's true it's just, you know, I had a friend once that said, oh, no, they must be good because they're in the top 40. And I was like, well, that doesn't always equate. <laughs> mm. I mean, you know, they, you, they got to be doing something right, but it doesn't necessarily mm. mean the music's right. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> but that's a cynical point of view, I'm sure, because if you really look at it, if you really look at it, like you say, some things are just best worth not sharing because that takes away the illusion doesn't it yeah that's that's it that's exactly it it's like a play like a play you don't want to see that people don't want i mean i just i guess when you think about a play you're not seeing the people that are pulling the ropes of the props in the background you're just seeing the the beautiful actors and the and the props that are like painted you don't see the you know the people busting their asses in the back because it's a yeah. part of this show, the theatrics, right? The theater of it all. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. I mean, you leave that for when you see people perform live and shit, don't you? A, that's that's really where you where what you do comes alive. How 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 does that work? If because just listening to the richness of the the songs that you're creating, like what's the what's the ensemble on what? How do you envisage the ensemble on stage on any upcoming? live shows it's actually you know it's it's a lot of work because it's a uh, there's so much going on in the songs um so what i've done in the past is i'll have you know i'll have like a, a conductor kind of guy who does uh the, the keyboard and he has like the computer 
with like some like other like instrumentals that are sent or sample like samples of like like stems that can't be done like by a live musician. That's that's he's called, he's called Mr. Responsible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he you know this 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 role is such a precious role because they're also like conducting like the other band members, like the, they're conducting the bass player, the drummer, and uh yeah. You know, because like, yeah, I, I like write the songs and stuff, but like, and I'm so grateful to have the, this person, these people like taking this role up because I can't imagine myself having to teach like three or four people like all this shit and a lot Trust of the stuff mad, like, man. and a lot of stuff that I like contribute to on production or if when I write a song like it's a lot of stuff I don't even remember how I freaking played it, mm. you know? It's like I just <laughs> put it down and then it's like. Like about you know, in the vault of, you know, it's so on to the next. So I'm really grateful that that's what that's what we've been doing. It's sick because playing live with a band is just it's not compare. There's nothing co- comparable, you know. Especially a band that can rip some uh, rip some uh, some dope music, you know. Like play some like I, all the guys I've played with live have been are crazy musicians. Mm-hmm. It's been and it's sick because I can like focus on singing, you know, I can focus on being a performer and rocking the crowd uh, and, you know, being in, more intimate with the crowd rather than having to focus myself on like playing guitar, you know, and singing at the same time, which I can do, but I prefer just singing, you know, when I'm performing. It's such a lot, isn't it? Because I think even as like taking that responsibility away from you and, and delegating it to someone else, just the mind of an artist is like your your head must be going 10 to the dozen with a whole heap of different things that people would never ever even contemplate particularly live it's just a lot going on isn't it yeah a lot going on it's like hoping that you know hoping that the the band is sounding good hoping that the sound guy that's like maybe not even our sound guy is like doing like an okay job at leveling things out then I'm worried about my voice. I'm worried about how I do I look cool, <laughs> you know, like uh uh <laughs> am I engaging with the crowd enough? Um I mean at the end of the day, I mean these kind of things are nothing compared to like the struggles that like like workers face, obviously. This it sounds like a whiny thing to be an artist and say, Oh, I gotta worry about rocking the crowd, like. I'm, you know, I'm blessed to get to do this, but it's definitely something that's, it's interesting, you know, it's like, I don't know, it's a different side of it. You know, a lot of the questions you're asking me, they're making me like, think about things that I haven't even really thought about when it comes to my role as an artist. That's the shit I'm talking about. (laughs) If you know, you know, baby. (laughs) Um. Well, interestingly, because as you you you, you uh, alluded to, you know that uh, you know a more of a high class problem in that we're you know we're talking about here of like the artist life sort of thing, mm-hmm. but but um, contrary to that, I feel like the, the comparable of like having uh, a that nine to five job against being an artist. Sure, there's a lot of fun stuff, and it ain't really like a. It's not like we're complaining about the the, the prospect of doing these things because we love it, mm-hmm. but. But I think that the difference is just for people to get an understanding is like when you go and do a job, you're getting paid to do it. When you're being an artist and you've got to go and perform live, people are hedging their bets on you. Essentially, isn't it? That's true. And it, yeah, it's not a, it's not like a steady. There's like the thing. Yeah, that's true. And like with a nine to five, you're like you have a fixed. Uh, fixed income, you know, you have like you have like a. Um, What's the word? Consistency. Uh, yeah, that's right. But as an artist, you don't. It could be like, especially with COVID, like our, the main income from from being an artist went out the door. You know, so that's been super difficult. And that's like, yeah, that's like a that's definitely a con and a, and a struggle of uh, being an artist. Yeah, that's a good point. It's been it it could be tough. Yeah, man. And I, on one hand, it's like it's being removed from doing any live entertainment work it can be super creative in a sense okay with restriction comes that creativity that we all love but then on the flip side you're like well when am i gonna go back and perform am i gonna be any good anymore will my friends family fans like me yeah 
That's Are they true, still yeah. there? <laughs> yeah, like uh, it's it's like yeah. There's that. It's that nervousness. But it, I think the nervousness of that is kind of cool because it kind of brings you back to the where you were when you first started. You know, it's like getting a weird reset to where you you're nervous again about like, oh, are people gonna like this? Are people gonna show up? Like those are thoughts that you have uh, early on, and so having that that kind of nervousness. It's kind of dope because it, I think it pushes you even harder, you know. So, a hundred, yeah, I would imagine that is certainly the case. And it must feel pretty. It must feel pretty fucking good, Cola Boy, to know that you've got some ammunition ready to fire out when it's time. You must be like, you must be sitting there knowing full well that you're sitting on some time bombs. Yeah, I mean, I hope that the you know I hope that the time bombs because you know I love the the record and I'm excited for the world here, but I. You know, of course, I you know I'm only human, and I I also you know have my you know have my uh, what's the word? it's not doubts, but you know like you know you're just like you see you're like okay, well we'll see we'll see how people how people like it, you know, and yeah, being, remaining like uh yeah, I guess just reserved and being like yeah, well we'll see, you know, but yeah. for you to say that you know. That I'm sitting on time bombs. That means a lot because yeah, man, I put a lot of work, put a lot of work into this, into this record, and it, you know, I think it shows. It's a, it's a. I mean, don't forget the neighborhood is the name of the tune, and um, it's a, it's a departure in terms of what, of 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 the back catalog, having the avalanches involved in collaborative fashion. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's always a win, you know. Um, it does feel like. <laughs> It's interesting when you said Anderson Pack, because then I'm like, ah, oh, you know what? There's there's a place for this sound way more than than I think we realize at this point. Do you know what I mean? That there's a there's an ever expanding openness that I think a younger audience are getting more tuned into you know, real instruments and shit, <laughs> you know. I think they're mm-hmm. tired a little bit of the mumble rap stuff and they're, they're actually looking in a little more deeper into how things are made and, and the kind of artists that are making them. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think it's also cool because in turn, then that pushes other artists to meet that that expectation too. I mean, I mean, looking at like like certain, like, you know, contemporary like rappers, especially like the big ones, like, like one of my favorites right now, like he's like super famous, obviously. He's like Roddy Rich. Yeah. He freaking plays the synth. He sits, he plays the freaking p- this keyboard. Like That's live. What you need. He sings. So yeah, man. Dope. Like, yeah, man. And not only that, his like vocal melodies are just crazy. So yeah. To me, it's like him him pushing himself to that, mm. to that standard. I don't know if he did it because I think he probably did it just because he he liked it. It wasn't like I doubt it was like a a thing where he was trying to meet meet like expectations of, of people these days but I mean I think he really sets a bar and I think that's what what's really cool is that as things are advancing and changing that it sets the bar higher for like artists and it, I think one other thing that really sets the bar is how much music now is kind of expanding genre wise like artists are like really being experimental with like yeah. using genres together or incorporating like I, I can count I can't even count how many of my homies who I've been friends with in music for years who have been from like indie and like uh like more like folk or indie and rock music yeah. like incorporating like hip-hop aspects or even more like contemporary like pop and like or like auto-tune even and like but in a really cool and interesting way yeah and knowing that like we're at that point in music where those boundaries are being like you can't you know they're, they're being the boundaries are being taken destroyed and people are not afraid to take those risks and it's really dope that is really dope, and I like the, like you were saying, having having any artist, particularly ones of an of 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 a of an art form or a genre where you least expect them to play it, mm-hmm. that becomes like an entry hole to, um, you know, uh, people that are into the music. It becomes an entry hole for them to expand their horizons on what is possible within the music, like. Like when, um, oh, you example, I'm trying to think of it. Well, actually, um, Andre 3000. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like all of a sudden, he 
comes out with that album, was it 2008? Love Below? The Love Below mm-hmm. album, 2006 I think maybe. before that, maybe 2000. I feel like it was 20, 2004. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, <laughs> I think I'm in denial. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he literally blew the doors off in such an extreme way of showing people what, how far you can expand mm-hmm. on, on your own style and your own genre. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and having and doing it in like a and doing it in a really precise and tasteful way that uh, isn't it isn't it doesn't seem fabricated it doesn't seem forced it's like mm-hmm. a genuine thing and it's also like uh, at the core of it you know you could still even if like an hundred thousand song that that from the from Love Below at the even if it he like it's some random genre like. At the core of it, it's still you could still tell you hear it and you can tell it's hundred thousand. Like that's the best. Is like, and that's what I shoot for with my music. Is like I can have a record like this new record, you know, Prosody Boombox, where the genres change so much in this in the record, but at the core of it, there's something that that makes it all cohesive, and it's still you could tell it's me. And you know, I think that's really the key with uh, as far as being an artist today. A thousand the, percent. On a sonic uh, level, on a sonic level, on a on a on a um, on a DNA level, isn't it? Yeah, and just you know, taking risks and not giving a damn, and just you know, doing it, doing what you want to do. Uh, What's the biggest risk you've like, taken? I don't know. In mu- music wise, I would say like in general, but yeah, music in, first. In, in general, I don't know. I, maybe. Yeah, I don't want maybe I don't I don't want to speak out on uh, the risks I've taken that outside of music, but uh, as far as <laughs> but uh, as far as music goes, I think with this album I started a little bit delving into more like hip hop uh, influences, you know, more than I always had those influences a little bit in like delivery and stuff of like with vocal delivery, but also like on this record I use auto tune, I use. Uh, you know, I, I I do some stuff like that. Like, I think that's like the biggest, not even a risk, but I think I just said F it and went forward on it and just did it. Uh, and so I think that's a big risk because, you know, people, you know, people, the thing is, it's, it's frustrating is that there's music lovers in diff- of different genres who look down on other genres or like, you know, of course, yeah. if people, people tend to look down on hip hop or, even look down on popular music and look at it like, oh, that's just dumb, uh, you know, cheap music or like, just like, eh, but, it, you know, so I think uh, really showing that I have a, a respect for all these genres and all these different styles and using them tastefully um, really uh, challenges that, that, that tendency for people to, to compartmentalize things and then in turn compartmentalize the fans of the, that music, you know. So I, you know, as I always talk about, I, I really want to bring people together with my music. Uh, so I think that aspect of blending genres is a another tool in that. Yeah, I love. And again, just I, I love individuality in in artistry and music. Like putting auto tune on on you, for instance. I mean, mm-hmm. in fact, there's, there's people we, people who complain about auto tune. I particularly when being used with an eye such yourself who's clearly who's clearly like on his on his game and knows how to do things without the auto tune i always hop back to like you know the zap and rogers and and you know mm-hmm. the p funk you know they, they were using you know they were using all those sorts of technical gears to the, you know what I mean? They were using harmonics and, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff to make their voices yeah. sound great, you know? And it's just another, it's another instrument, another tool, you know? And it's, at the end of the day, a good song is a good song. Um, you know, at the core of, of, of something is a good song or is a bad song. So whatever thing you put on top of that, if the song's good enough, it'll, you know, it'll come out. And bleed through, and you'll, mm. you'll be able to recognize that. How many tunes have you got in the bank? That's a tough one. I would say, mm, I would say probably like if I really did a deep dive into like all this, all my demos from the past like uh, eight years, 
I would say uh, not many, actually, probably like a 120, 130. That's, okay. you know, I, I, and I could also be wrong. I could have more, I could have less, but I think, yeah. And that's like songs, like full on songs. I also have like little, little snippets of like loops mm. and things that I kind of just blurbed out a, a random idea and never really went back to it, you know? Mm. It's just, a, yeah, okay, my next question. My next thought was, what's your batting average on on one of, any of those hundred plus songs? What's the batting average in one of them being like a yo? Don't forget about that one. That could be a hit. What's the batting average? You know, I was really prolific when I first started recording. I I was in a really depressed moment in my life, and I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a music career or anything either. So I I had a lot of time on my hands to really every single day sit and record and work on songs. So. At that time, I, I did a, like 70 songs. Hmm. So actually, I probably have close to 200 songs when I think about it. So I had like 70 songs around that time. Um, and all those, we went through them with my label and we picked out like 10 uh, to work that on. That must have been a fucking mission, bro. <laughs> yeah, it, it, for me, I was down and I open to do it or whatever because, you know, I was just stoked that record makers wanted to work with me, you know? So, you know, I was like wet behind the ears just like a kid who's like yeah i mean i wasn't a kid i was like 25 but 26 but compared to now i, I look at myself like i was a kid then, and you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so but back to your question as far as like batting average i would say one out of every like eight songs is probably like one that i'll i'll be like okay we got to work on this one that's pretty you good know? yeah I'd say one out of eight. And I, and I only say that because I think that also if I were to be way more like disciplined in just sitting down and working on music, it would be more. It would probably be like I could flesh out way more the songs. And like I would say it would probably be like, yeah, every three out of eight songs. Because I, I think like I have a pretty good consistent – uh, output as far as what I come up with, you know. But do you think you muse on stuff a little too long? Is that what you mean? Like by if I had a bit more da da da, do you feel like it's there's a lot of musing that goes on in before committing and saying yes, this is definitely it. Yeah, I think like uh, what really helps when as part of why I come to Paris too a lot is like I can really sit with my label, whether in the studio or just like listening to songs and really you know just dissecting each one and figuring out which ones we want to prioritize and which ones are strongest. And it, it's kind of, it can be hard, you know, not having, having, uh, having that team. Like, I mean, I do have them there. We can just zoom or whatever, but like, it's so much different when you're in person together and you're able to really sure. buckle down. So I think, yeah, I don't know. I definitely, uh, I'm pretty confident in my ability to like write a song. I think, you know, I think that's my strongest point. I think I, I could be, I could be better at production uh, or, you know, but I think it, a songwriting is like my strength and I, I'm pretty like confident in that area. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. Very robust, very, <laughs> very seasoned, my brother. <laughs> well, good luck to you, my friend. Best of luck. I hope it all goes really well, man. And, and you know, actually, also, while I'm on the subject, like, this is a real artist's life right here. Because to be traveling from the West Coast, mm-hmm. the States, to France, mm-hmm. every quarter, any mm-hmm. opportunity, that jet lag alone, having two different teams on two different parts of the planet, yeah. that's, that's some real sh- real deal. That's, that's proper. Yeah, I'm real grateful. And... It make those ten hour flights are worth it, you know. At the end of the day, yeah, yeah. Does it feel like home when you're in Paris? Yeah, I mean, more so the people, you know. Yeah. I, I've made really great friendships and relationships with like my label and with like so many friends out here. So, you know, that's what means everything to me. I have a one song that I've never, <laughs> I've never released, which is like kind of a funny song that's kind of a hip hop vibe that it talks about. It. it says like, when I'm traveling, I don't give a shit about tour tourist attractions and museums. All I want to do is sit on the street and talk to people and like drink wine or like drink a beer or drink a drink a whiskey and like 
talk and chop it up with people. Like that's what means everything to me. So yeah. home is like pe- the people are home, my home, you know? So I think that my home can be anywhere in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. And you can never have enough people, can you? That's the thing. Definitely. You know, those ones where you travel in and out because you've got a show in the evening and the next morning is like you're flying out. And people say to you, hey, how was the place like? Because I had no, no idea, but the people were great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I can, all I can say is like how they reacted to the music. And then other than that, I'm like, yeah. And then I feel bad because then people are like, what? You didn't even do this or this? I'm like, dog, this is my job. Like, I, I, I had no chance. I had to go. I had to freaking, you know, I had to leave at 1 a.m. to go to take a train and do blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I mean, so I'm always grateful when I get a couple days in a city. And of course, with Paris, I'm here for I'm here for two weeks right now. So so you're just chilling. Yeah. Cold, cold chilling, cold chilling, hot chilling. Actually, it's freaking scorching out. Yeah, man, it's fucking blazing out there. I hope it's blazing wherever you are, guys. Cola boy, you're a fucking star, man. I'm so it's such a privilege to chop it up and chat with you. Clearly, a man with his head screwed on and getting it done right, the right way. Got it, you know. Best of luck, my friend. You stay lucky, you. won't you? Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, man. Yeah, hope to uh, do it again someday. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, it'd be a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Hold tight, everybody. Good, uh... Big shout to yourselves. Thanks for joining us. You know what to do. Sharing is caring. Do not sleep. I repeat, do not sleep on this repeat. Gets the sharing. All right. Don't talk to anybody. I wouldn't kill a cat. A podcaster out. Thanks very much, Cola Boy. Peace out. Peace, my guy. Easy. Hey. <laughs>